Hi, and welcome back to Biblical Theology, Exegesis, and Hermeneutics, where meaning is always context-driven. I am your host, John Strazic, and today is definitely going to be a day of where meaning is always context-driven. So, get out your Bibles and open them up to Hebrews. We're in chapter 10, and we're looking at verses 26 to 31, and it will definitely be challenging today, um, and hopefully it will be informative. Okay. Okay, and coming to this side, uh, we will allow um, Attridge to introduce us to our particular unit. The second section of the paranetic transition, which is best understood as a hortatory prelude to the next major section of the text, develops the allusion to divine judgment implicit in the reference to the day, and repeats the dire warning that had preceded uh, the central expository section, that is uh, chapter 6 verses 4 to 8. The dire warning here is initially issued in more general terms than were used earlier. For a Christian's sins, there is no possibility of renewed sacrifice, but only judgment and punishment. The warning is then bolstered by an a fortiori argument that recalls the first paranetic section, 2, 1 to 4. If repudiation of the Torah was punished by death, the repudiation of Christ's sacrifice merits an even more severe punishment. Verse 29. It now becomes clear that the object of the dire warning is not sin in general, but of the sin of willful apostasy. At the same time, the Christological grounds for the warning are apparent. The unique sacrifice provides a single basis for forgiveness. To repudiate it means to abandon hope of reconciliation. The a fortiori argument is framed with a scriptural citation that affirms the reality of God's judgment, verse 30, and one of the most forceful of Hebrews' succinct summaries that, encapu- that encapsulates the solemn admonition of the paragraph is found in verse 31. Okay, so I thought that was very insightful um, uh, um, uh, of Attridge here to open up the text, and and you can see that he had thought through it, and he had been able to um, decipher um, its different uh, uh, units that 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 would that would appear from the text. So this was a very um, learned paragraph here that that we that we that we read it may it may it may it may help you to stop here and read through it again um, to digest it um, and and that way um, in doing so it, it really helps us to get a clear grasp uh, of the material that we um, are about to embark on Okay, so coming to this slide, we are going to then look here um, at um, our text, and we will offer a translation for it, as well as to try to find a workable uh, structural analysis for the text that will give us some kind of handles and a grasp on how to uh, proceed uh, with the text as it unfolds. Um, So beginning here in verse 26, um, for if we keep on sinning willfully after having received the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice concerning sin but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and jealousy of fire which is about to consume those who are adversaries anyone after having set aside the law of Moses dies upon the basis of two or three witnesses without mercy how much 
worse do you suppose one is considered worthy of punishment who has trampled under the Son of God and has considered the blood of the covenant profane and has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know the one who said, Vengeance belongs to me, I repay. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Okay, so there's our little uh, our, our little translation here uh, of this uh, rather short paragraph. And, um, and what I've done here, um, you can see here that this is going to be subsumed here underneath point B of our present analysis. And so this is the fourth warning against apostasy. And it concerns rejecting Christ to sacrifice and insulting the spirit of grace. Just like the prior you know, uh, unit had, had the three main hortatory uh, subjunctives, um, this particular paragraph is defined here by uh, these substantive participles that define one who rejects Christ and his sacrifice and and insults the spirit. So these things will be taken up here in verse 29 and they define the passage. So if you're looking how meaning is always context driven, verse 29 is going to be a very one of the, the 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 stronger elements of the passage that that help and assist bringing understanding to the text um, from the the general statement that is first offered in 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 verse twenty six. Um, but so let's go ahead and, and and try to see the bigger picture here. I I divided the text into um, four distinct units okay so first there is the uh, warning to the community against persistent willful sin and eternal judgment okay um, and that means exactly what it means because that's when you read this text it's just pretty obvious we're just we're not trying to we're trying to bring out what's in the text out of it we're not trying to import something into this text from outside of it remember you know this uh, this channel is devoted to biblical theology. That is developing a theology straight out of the Book of Hebrews. Okay, so you know you want to have a Pauline theology first. You want to have a Petrine theology, Johannine theology, and you want to then take all of these theologies together and create from them a systematic theology, which is important. Of course, it is. But you 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 have to first. It's the the first step here is exegesis uh, and hermeneutics, um, and and then that's brought to bear upon each book in biblical theology. So that's the way I like to proceed. And so, following a theology of the Book of Hebrews, um, this particular um, statement here, warning to the community against persistent willful sin and eternal judgment definitely fits okay um, and it's against the community because it begins here with we you know so the author includes himself in this warning if we you know are going are continuously sinning okay um, so you know this is a genitive absolute with adverbial application it has to be verbally because it's taking on then the attributes of a conditional uh, type of a verbial um, participle with you know defined by the word if here and that definitely works here so this uh, genitive absolute is an verbial participle that is uh, conditional in nature so that's why we or if we continuously sin willfully, okay. Um, so then there's per, so it's persistent and and it begins with a, a gar here, which connects it to what went before. 
So, so now when you go back and you look at what went before, well, what was what was the connecting tissue? Well, remember the as you see the day approaching, right? The day of the Lord. So remember, you know, the day of the Lord is salvation for some, but judgment for others. Okay. So you can see then here that uh, you know that this part of the text is picking up the bad part of the day. Okay, the part of the day that you know for people who reject Christ and His sacrifice. Well, it's not going to be a day of salvation for them, but one of judgment, which this text talks about. So it's talking about apostates. Okay, so fourth warning against apostasy. It really fits good because that that's descriptive of, of exactly what's going on in this text. Okay, uh, and then there's a temporal clause here, after receiving the knowledge of the truth. So if we go on willfully, persistently, you know, sinning after, okay, receiving the knowledge of the truth. Remember now, our author was connected to part of the Pauline entourage of some type, remember, because he addresses Timothy here, you know, as if he's a long, you know, he's a long-time friend, okay, so, an associate, so, um, so, this, this phraseology is common to Pauline theology, especially in the pastorals, so we're going to take this as a definitely meaning this is talking about a Christian, and if we have we, and the author himself includes himself, so of course this is talking about Christians having become born again, and then if they persist in, in willful sin, well then there's eternal damnation waiting for them after that. Okay, That's what this text states. That's the theology of this book. Like it or not, like it or not, this text doesn't doesn't sit doesn't talk about one saved always saved. Doesn't even doesn't go there. Okay, it, 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 this here is this author's defining his own theology throughout this whole book, and we're on the fourth of five warnings, and his warnings are, you know, um, you know salvation's conditional here. Okay. Conditioned upon your continued confession uh, of Christ, okay, it's not based on works. It's just it's based on your continued confession uh, of Christ and His sacrifice. And as long as you're doing that, folks, you are eternally secure. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, so, but but he, he's talking about people who reject. These are theological apostates. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll understand this as we go through the text. Okay, so this point alpha here, okay, verses 26 and 27 make up a unit. So just follow follow the text. We'll read it. We'll reread it. For if we go on sinning continuously, willingly, after having received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer left a sacrifice concerning sins. But, so this but is going to connect verse 26 and 27 together. So that's why I have them together here. So it's, it's offering a contrast here. Okay, so it's, you know, it, it, it said that there's, it, 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 he just told us there's no more sacrificial remedy. But he's going to tell us what what there is left, okay? But there is left a certain fearful expectation of judgment, and there is left a jealousy of fire which is about to consume those who oppose or who, who are adversaries. That's how you are to understand um, who pen antius here. Okay, um, it is uh, those who are opposed, those who are opposed, or the adversaries. Okay, now that that makes a nice unit right there. Okay, it offered a contrast of judgment here um, 
verse 28 and 29 are going to go a little different way. Anyone, after having set aside the law of Moses, dies upon the basis of two or three witnesses without mercy. How much more? So this correlative pronoun here it is then it is it is then it is then definitely connected to verse 28 by a what we would call a calva omer a, a lesser to greater argument or an a fortiori argument and our author is fond of this okay um, and we've already seen this as uh, we saw back in two one to four okay um, and then to come back here to verse 29. How much, right, <clears throat> worse do you suppose of uh, of punishment shall he be considered worthy of who has, now get this, who has trampled under the Son of God, who has considered the blood of the covenant profane by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the spirit of grace. Okay, um, so that so this here leaves an open question: How much more worthy of punishment do you suppose the one who has done these three things? Right? Uh, how much you know? How much more worthy is he considered worthy of punishment than who? Than the guy that re rejected the law of Moses, okay? Because why? Because the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. And the law of Moses is lesser than the law of Christ. Okay. So, the rejection of the Old Testament sacrifice is one thing, but if you reject the New Testament sacrifice of Christ, well then there is no longer a a sacrifice left concerning sin because the only sacrifice that is here is the one that Christ provided. So if we continue on in sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, then there is no longer remains a sacrifice concerning sin. So there's Christ's sacrifice. You rejected it. You How did you reject it? You trampled under the foot the Son of God. You considered profane the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified and you insulted the spirit of grace. So that's how you become an apostate. Okay. So this is not talking about somebody going out and sowing their wild oats on some stupid, you know, temptation they had uh, and then they come back to themselves. Because that person does not reject the sacrifice of Christ. He does not trample underfoot and treat the blood of the covenant as profane. Okay, So he repents and, 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 and gets in line and, and learns to never do something like so, so foolish again. Okay, so um, and so such is life for you know for 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 Christians. Okay, um, so when you read verse 26 there is an element of Wow, well this this could have a wide application. What does this mean? We got to get some kind of handles on it. Well, when you come to point B, the rhetorical question concerning covenantal apostasy by an a fortiori calva omer argument, well that defines then the how meaning is context driven. It's it's talking about a theological apostate just like we talked about. Go back and review Hebrews um, chapter 6 verses 4 to 12 that I, we covered earlier already. So this is going right back to these people who are theological apostates. Back there we had somebody who re-crucified Christ anew to themselves. So that's saying that yeah, Christ was a kook and you know, his sacrifice was nothing. I'm glad that Pilate crucified him. Well, that's a theological apostate. And then putting him to open shame, going into the back to the synagogue and mocking and saying, yeah, I was a fool, you know, Christ was a kook, and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's a theological apostate. 
And that's the same thing that's going on here, but said in, in quite a little in different terms. It's talking more more here about trampling under the you know this is stomping on this is stepping down, uh, you know stamping your feet down on the Son of God that He's not the Messiah. Okay, the Son of God, you know He's not the Messiah. He's not God's, you know you're not sitting at God's right hand. Okay. His sacrifice of the covenant was profane. It means it was just like the blood of a pig or the blood of a goat, or it's just it's just it's just any type of blood. It's nothing. It's considered worthless. Okay, uh, by which he was sanctified. So this tells us here that you know it, it's talking about a somebody who was a true believer that had been at one time sanctified by the blood of Christ. Okay, so that's why this is talking about an apostate here. Okay, I, I'm not twisting the text. This is what the text says. You're going to have to twist this if you want to come out of this breathing alive, once saved, always saved. Or if you want, if you want to come out of this reformed, okay, well then you're going to have to deform the text, okay, because you ain't putting your square peg of reformed theology nor are you putting your square peg of once saved always saved in 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 Hebrews is round peg it just don't fit here okay your 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 square okay don't fit in there okay don't try to impose this theology here cuz it don't work in the book of Hebrews okay um, and i'm just following the text being honest not making just following it and whatever it says just swallow it and that's how you have you just have to be willing to just accept the bottom line and 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 not you just you just don't go there you don't just you, you don't twist we're not scripture twisters okay second peter 316 it's for scripture twisters we're not doing that here Okay, so this a fortiori argument here ends with a question. So, you, so the, we had the reader. Okay, remember this 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 book was written by a Jew to Jews. So, so how so understanding who it was written to and by, the, you know, this is a Jewish document. Okay, so so when you read this with Jewish eyes, the one who's who tramples under the Son of God, who considers the blood of the covenant, the new covenant, as profane by which he was sanctified and insulted the spirit of grace. Well then, wouldn't you want to understand this through Jewish eyes? Boy, meaning is always context-driven. Okay? Um, and and, and uh, it becomes very crystal clear what's going on here. This is talking about the sin of apostasy. It's not just some willful sin that somebody did. This is about a willful, persistent sin of rejecting Christ, sonship, and his sacrifice, and thereby insulting the spirit of grace. If that's what you're into, there's no hope for you. There's no sacrifice left for you. You're not... this. There, to, to try to put once saved, always saved, that these people here are going to go to heaven who trample under the foot of God and call the blood of the covenant common and, and profane? They ain't going to make it into heaven. What are you talking about? David Allen, get a grip. Go back and read the text. Meaning is always context driven. Thank God. Okay, so that takes up point B. Okay, now when you come here to verse 30, you got a guard. So we got a basis statement, and it's a scriptural basis statement, right? For the Calva Ohm argument, right? So there's two citations, right, that come in verse 30, um, and it's about retribution theology. Okay, it's it, it's not about um, you know disciplinary theology. This is all about 
retribution theology. I mean, think about the text. What is left but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and jealousy of fire that's about to consume those who are adversaries. That's called retribution. I mean, that's not has nothing whatsoever to do with disciplinary theology or, or you know how David wants to import uh, you know First Corinthians uh, three fifteen into here. I mean, come on. I mean, th- th- this is retribution theology. It's got it written all over. It. Vengeance is mine. Vengeance is not talk. It's retribution theology got it all written over it I will repair and again the Lord will judge his people Um, and uh, so so here folks um, this is talking about context is talking about judgment here okay and then he and and to to let you know to let you know it's uh, the, the future tense crine here to let you know that it's talking about judgment and not vindication, okay, for those who are in the know, okay. Um, he never would have ended his, you know, made his auth- the author's summary statement. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Okay, so so um, it, it's talking about, this is talking about eternal punishment in hell uh, because it's dealing with... Um, judgment that is going to come against those who are adversaries, those who are opposed and it's retribution okay you know, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15 doesn't have anything to do with you know, retribution th- theology upon uh, those who are adversaries of God, okay, alright I mean, so, so, so um, certain theologians here are just their boat just sank all right and no matter how you try to come to this text and impose some squared theology upon Hebrews as round hole it ain't gonna fit so you got to go back to the drawing board of what is called biblical theology and and you just have to be willing to just face the music and follow the text where it goes. And that's what I'm willing to do. And I don't care. Okay? And I don't care what the costs are. Uh, the, co- the costs are greater by, by, by telling somebody they're once saved, always saved. Um, and that, the, you know, you can go on, you know, you, 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 this doesn't apply to you. I mean, it's just, it's abusing the text in so many ways. Okay? Because uh, this text is talking about theological apostates, it's not, you know you have to you, you know it's talking about written from a Jew to Jews. So what were Jews doing at this time? They were leaving the Christian assembly and going back to the Jewish synagogue uh, that gathered under the terms of the first covenant and opposed and and would kick out anybody who 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 believed that Jesus was the Messiah. So this is, you know, verse 29 is talking about a theological apostate, somebody who rejects uh, Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. He rejects the blood of the covenant as common and insults the Spirit of grace. Well, that person's not going to heaven. I'm sorry. Under any... So that's not somebody that, that, that we're going to be in heaven with. Somebody who pisses on the blood of Christ... And, and poops upon the Son of God and tramples them down and spits on the Spirit of grace. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry if you're offended by the language, but that's what this language states. And and, and the, the quicker that you recognize this, the quicker you come out of your deception. Um, and those are strong words, but you know what? It's strong words because... Don't you go and and, 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 and and try to tell somebody that this has nothing whatsoever to do with uh, apostates uh, 
Christians losing their salvation. It absolutely does. But it's talking about an apostate, a theological apostate. Okay, And this is all about retribution theology. It has nothing whatsoever to do with paideia, with, 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 with some type of you know, um, uh, discipline. No, uh -uh. this is, this is ret retribution theology. That's what this is all about. It's pretty simple, folks. Okay, um, coming here, um, I'm going to follow the lead here um, of Dana Harris um, uh, referring to uh, Thusia here and Ek Doke here and Zalos. All as predicate nominatives. So I went ahead and, and then, uh, you know, in the uh, this diagrammatical analysis, put them here as uh, predicate nominatives, and uh, and then you know we repeated here the uh, ellipsis of apa lepetai here, um, taken here from uh, verse uh, twenty six here. Um, <coughs> Or there's no longer left a, a sacrifice concerning sin, right? But, right, it's adversative that binds these two together. But what is left? A certain fearful expectation of judgment is left, right? And um, the and, and there is left a a jealous a, a, a zeal of fire. Right is left, um, which is about to uh, consume uh, those who oppose. Okay, so s the ain here um, about to consume. That's a that's a you know this is just this is just in Hebrew. It's a, a call here. To, um, it literally means to eat. Okay, um, so but we tra we translate it. Um, to uh, uh, to consume. Okay, um, so so looking at these as predicate uh, nominatives is is quite novel. And thank you, Dana Harris, for that suggestion. Um, and here we have so we we have our um, genitive absolute here. Okay, and it's going to be loosely connected to apa le petai. Uh, because generally considered uh, genitive absolutes lie outside of the sentence, but but they they are they, they would fall underneath adverbial participles, okay? And here it takes up the meaning of condition here, okay? So if if we willingly continue in sin, there is, so this is a, an imperfect. Um, or an impersonal use of the verb. There is no longer left a sacrifice concerning sins. Okay. Um, and, and then we have this temporal clause after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Okay. Um, and then this, this, this uh, so by looking here at the contrastive uh, way that the verses 26 and 27 are bound together by this but here. Okay. So it contrasts <clears throat> to the negative statement that there is no longer a sacrificial remedy. Well, then what, what is left? Well, it gives us two different things. A certain fearful expectation of judgment is left. And what's more, there is left a, a jealousy of fire which is about to consume uh, the adversaries. So this is definitely talking about retribution theology. Okay, retribution for those who turn their back upon, you know, uh, uh, upon uh, upon Christ. Which, well, you know, at, at first we're we're kind of we're kind of stupefied at first. To be honest with you, you know, looking at just if it was just left to this, I mean, wow, I mean. Uh, uh, 
this this would have a wide application of meaning here. Okay, this would have a very wide application of meaning. So that's why you remember meaning is always context driven. So when we come down here um, to our next unit, um, if you want to uh, follow. Uh, this particular slide, you can stop it to look at the how um, Dalich is going to connect uh, Melantes refers to the day of verse 25. There, that, that's a, that's a good slide, uh, but I'm going to move on. Um, but coming here, then when we come here to verse 28, um, then we're coming to this this Calva Omer or this a fortiori argument and this is where then the meaning is always context driven it begins to develop um, the uh, the shape and meaning of what he uh, exactly uh, what was in his mind here for these people that he conceived of in verses 26 to 27 so he does this by this Calva Omer, or a uh, fortiori argument, um, which basically states um, anyone, right? Okay, anyone, after having set aside the law of Moses, dies without mercy upon the basis of two or three witnesses. Okay, so so I'm taking this to be temporal okay and why why am I doing that well because remember in verse 26 right we had um, after having received the knowledge of the truth that was also temporal okay so I'm continuing here with the temporal idea that was already uh, inserted into the text all right so so this may be best taken as temporal so, so one who's already made up that he's already made his decision, okay. So, so this this adverbial here is going to be temporal. Uh, the one who has set aside the law of Moses um, dies upon the basis of two or three witnesses without mercy, okay. Um, and so we can see, that, you know, this is developed out of uh, Deuteronomy, okay. And I think it's like seventeen. Um, we can see that. I think I got the text here. Okay, so coming to this slide, you know, our author alluded to this text here based upon the, the you know, the basis of two or three witnesses. So this comes out of Deuteronomy 17, and it says, and, and when there is found in your midst uh, in one of your gates that Yahweh your God is giving to you, a man or woman uh, that shall do evil in the eyes of Yahweh your God uh, to transgress his covenant and he goes and he serves other gods and bows down to them um, that is to the sun and the moon and to all or to all the host of heaven which I have not commanded and it is declared to you and you hear and you shall hear and you shall search out um, thoroughly uh, and behold the, um, uh, if the truth is is fixed okay, of the matter uh, of the, this, and this abomination is done in Israel you shall bring out that man or that woman okay, which has done this evil thing to your gate <clears throat> the man or the woman and you shall stone with stones that they die at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses. The one who's, who is to die shall be put to death. Uh, he shall not be put to death at the mouth of one witness. And the hand of the witnesses shall be against him first to kill him and the hand of all of the people afterward and you shall burn out the evil from your midst hallelujah 
So that's uh, that's how you that's how they got rid of apostates. Okay, um, in, in the Old Testament, um, people that served other gods and, and and worshipped the host of heaven and bowed down to the sun and moon. Okay, that's just like our text here. So our text is picking up on somebody who's trampled under Jesus's messiahship. They have treated his blood. Uh, that the blood of Christ is piss means nothing. It's not sacrificial. It did. And they reject the sacrifice of Christ, and they insult the Spirit of Grace. Well, these three things here are very, very closely akin to in a, uh, a theological apostate underneath the Old Testament. These people died and went to hell to Sheol. Okay, and um, they were put to death. So how much more worthy is considered the one who tramples under the Son of God and you know considers the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, sold the Spirit of grace, of worse punishment, dude? You are going down. Okay, that's the that's just the the straight out meaning. If you want to say they're going up, David Allen, <laughs> I mean. I mean, I, it's just, dude, it's black and white here, guy. You know, it, this isn't disciplinary punishment. This is all about retribution theology upon apostates. Okay? Sorry, folks. That's... Uh, what it means. So this text, we, we, we looked at this one already. Uh, this is a, a Calva Omer argument here, uh, and the Afutori uh, argument here um, that was applied back here in chapter two, verses one to four. You can see that here, taken up in two to three a. Okay, you can see that whole argument here. I just inserted that old slide there. Okay. Um, and we need to keep moving on. Okay, so so we come in here to the uh, the 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 Homer part, okay, of the argument, right? The light to heavy. This is the heavy part, all right. So, um, so we're going to start down here with this correlative interrogative. Um, pronoun here, paso, okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, how much worse punishment do you suppose he shall be counted worthy, who, so this, this particular um, definite article is going to, is going to then serve for here, and for here, and for here, so it's, it's, it's three timing here, okay, the one who has trampled under the Son of God, the one who has considered the blood of the covenant profane, okay, uh, and has insulted the Spirit of Grace. So, so we're, we're to cons you know. So here's the question: How much worse do you suppose? He shall be counted worthy of punishment who has done these things than the guy who underneath the cow part of the argument, the one who set aside the the law of Moses, dies upon the basis of two or three witnesses. So if that was physical punishment, this is spiritual punishment, okay? And it's not it's not this has nothing whatsoever to do here with uh, disciplinary punishment taken out of, of first Corinthians 15 in our three in our 315 excuse me you can't take you can't import first Corinthians 315 into this text this is not talking about somebody this is talking about a theological apostate somebody who rejects the sonship of Jesus. No, he's not the Son of God. He's not the Messiah. No, his blood is is common. It's profane. It didn't. It's his blood is not efficacious for anybody. It's to be borne out, poured out on the ground on the cross, and he insults the Spirit of Grace. 
this type of person's not going to heaven. I'm sorry. When you understand who the text is written by and who it's written to, then you're going to finally understand how to understand all this stuff. Okay? So, you know, those people, um, they're not interpreting the text properly. And I'm sorry. I'm going to go there. I'm going there. Okay? And, and, and this is a pariah. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3.15 warns Christians who at the time of judgment will suffer loss, but only as one escaping through the flames. Here the loss is not salvation, and fire is being used metaphorically for judgment of those who are Christians and who enter heaven after judgment. Okay, Now, I'm not disputing with David there one bit. Okay, That's what 1 Corinthians 3.15 is all about. But if 1 Corinthians 3.15 said that these people here were, were, were rejecting Christ's Messiahship, trampling the Son of God underfoot, and treating the blood of Christ as profane, that it's not efficacious to save your soul, I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're talking apples and oranges here, David, and you're doing this all to, I'm sorry, I'm going to go there to keep your job okay all right uh you know you know is it really worth it if one person reads your commentary and they end up in hell well david told me i i'm not going to hell well you know um man uh i just want to be true to the text so i'm not going to be judged okay one interesting fact frequently missed by those who view warning passages as referring to eternal judgment on apostates is the absence of the adjective eternal connected with judgment mentioned in the warning passages okay david well we just read that the the that there's a certain expect fire a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fire of jealousy which is about to consume the adversaries David is talking about adversaries adversaries don't go to heaven when they're that's, that's that is a vindictive and retributive judgment David okay and that's where you're missing it okay just because it doesn't have the term here eternal doesn't save you it doesn't it doesn't save you david okay all right the author of the book of hebrews doesn't believe in this never did he never heard of it okay he would trample this doctrine under underfoot i, I can guarantee you that given the frequency of the use of this adjective throughout the new testament to speak of eternal judgment um, everlasting destruction um, da, 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 da. and given the frequency of the use of eternal in Hebrews itself um, David says I therefore can say it's not talking about eternal judgment <laughs> that's basically what he's telling us here the absence of the term in the warning passages is, is significant that, that you know but this is just a, he's doing eisegesis folks this is pure um pure eisegesis and you know that's typically what a theologian does okay um, I'm, I'm not I, I'm, I'm just I'm sticking with biblical theology exegesis and hermeneutics I ain't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not I'm not buying it David uh, and neither is anybody and neither is anybody else drinking your Kool-Aid uh, thank God Lane didn't thank God uh, Cockrell didn't Thank God. Uh, oh, boy. Oh, who's this guy? Ellingworth did. So, thank God the big heavyweights, they all didn't drink your Kool-Aid. All right? And I ain't about to, and I don't think anybody should be drinking this Kool-Aid. It's bad stuff. Really bad stuff. 
Um, okay, and uh, so then it then after verses twenty eight to twenty nine, we come upon thirty here, which is a basis statement that goes into for we know. Okay, uh, and then here uh, the the uh, the re, you know, scriptural report formula here, the one who said. Uh, then goes into you know offers direct speech um, vengeance belongs to me I will repay and again uh, the Lord shall judge um, his people okay um, so so this text here is picking up out of out of the you know the uh, the Ha'azinu you know uh, passage out of Deuteronomy 32 you know the, the song of Moses here and he's already done. He's already alluded to this text back in the first chapter, verse, I believe, verse six it was, um, where he alluded to to Deuteronomy thirty-two. Uh, but here he's talking about vengeance belongs to me. So the vengeance is not about retribution, David. Okay, I mean it's not talking about disciplinary uh, judgment. Vengeance is talking about retribution. Okay, so. So meaning is always context driven. All right? And we're following this text and it means what it says. Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay. Okay? So we know the context where this comes from. It's judgment um, uh, you know, uh, uh, upon the nations and then again the Lord will judge his people. He's going to judge the apostates uh, of his people. Okay? Um, that's what's going on here. Um, and then our author here then sums up uh, the the paragraph with his own summary statement right here. Um, and and so what we do is we, we have this elliptical construction here. Uh, the, the verb est in is not in the part of the text, but it's elliptically has to be brought in. And it's going to be... <coughs> excuse me, impersonally um, interpreted, which always then then allows us then to take the um, the infinitive clause here and that it will be functioning substantively to, to take the place of the noun and the subject um, here. Um, and it's done so by, by the use of an impersonal use of the verb est in. It is a fearful so this this is going to be another um, predicate nominative where this um, faberos this adjective is being used substantively um, so fu it functions as a predicate nominative um, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God it, that's not a comforting statement it's not meant to be comforting and it's one of utter judgment okay that underscores everything that's been said okay uh, if you take this this saying here to be comforting well then um, you're a scripture twister okay um, that, there, there's there's uh, there's no hope for you okay <laughs> uh, it's just that's just the way it goes Okay, folks. Um, it's you know this passage was pretty simple. It wasn't that hard to understand as long as uh, you know verse twenty six and twenty seven was uh, understood as being controlled by twenty, um, ba basically by verse twenty nine, um, by you know, the Calvo Omer argument that's offered in twenty eight twenty nine, uh, and then that's. That 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 was then brought here to a basis statement that we just saw here, and then it goes into the scriptural basis for for that um, for the the judgment on apostates, and, and he uses this, the the Deuteronomy thirty two scriptures here to develop that, and then he 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 capstones it all with his own summary statement. Uh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Okay. Um, so I would definitely like your comments and those who um, have been predisposed to once saved, always saved. You know, I do hope that you give this uh, lecture um, and my, my exegetical analysis. Uh, I hope you weigh that and you take it seriously. 
um, and 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 I don't think I was uh, mess. I I was by no means in, interjecting theology from some other passage into this. It was just simply following the exegetical practices of this author as he's been doing so since chapter two. You know, um, and, and this is his fourth, um, you know, warning passage, and, and they haven't been pretty. And, and and I'm not importing one saved always saved because the author he, he not he, these are warnings. Okay, you got to remember these are warnings. He's not saying that his audience that this applies to his audience. He says he's saying that it technically it can. Okay, potentially, all right, uh, apply to them if they were to do these things. Okay, but 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 they're not. You know, their salvation is secure because they're still confessing and gathering. You know, this is this is somebody who refuses to confess Jesus as Lord. Okay, this is somebody who's left the reservation, and once you understand that. Hebrews was written by a Jew to Jews. Then, 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 you know, meaning's always context driven. So, like, should you know, share and subscribe, and email me with questions, whatever you got. And have a great day, and we'll be back next time.